The redesigned Mastercase H500P by Cooler Master now features a mesh front panel for maximum airflow to the 200mm RGB fans, improved mounting for the front and top panels, and the same distinct looks and helpful features as the original, like cable routing covers, 360 rad support, and a tinted tempered glass side panel. It's available in white and gunmetal gray, so click the sponsor link in the description to learn more. Excellent! What's up guys, welcome back to Pulse Hardware. Today's video is how to upgrade a computer. Uh, not any computer, but specifically the computer that I built over the past couple months. This was meant to be an entry level PC, less than $500 to get yourself off to the races with an AMD AM4 socket motherboard and an AMD Ryzen 3 2200G processor. Uh, this is the box for that one in there. And the reason we went with this specific processor is because it's new, it's a quad core, it's only 99 bucks, and it's got Vega graphics integrated. So this system has been running off of integrated graphics that's part of the processor since I've been testing it uh, over the past couple months. Now, part of my MO for this build was that it would have an upgrade path. And whenever I recommend parts to people for building a computer, I will often tell them, do you think you're gonna upgrade this in the future? Part of the joy and benefit of building your own computer is the ability to upgrade it when you have more money. And now that it is, uh, I wanna say early to mid 2018, maybe your tax return just came in or maybe it was your birthday and you got some money or something like that. All that is to say, you've got some cash, you're ready to upgrade your system. How are you gonna go about doing that? First, you gotta choose the parts to upgrade to. You gotta make sure everything's still compatible. And then of course, there's a physical process of doing the installation. Now our primary upgrade for today is gonna to be the CPU. Central Processing Unit, the 2200G that's already in there. Now, since that's a CPU and graphics card, we're gonna need to add a graphics card in as well. Uh, but the CPU, we're gonna be upgrading to this. This is the Ryzen 5 2600X. It's the new Ryzen 2 series of processors, although it's still backwards compatible with our existing B350 motherboard and AM4 socket. One thing about this processor is it's only a processor. It does not include graphics. So that means that we're gonna to need to upgrade our graphics at the same time by adding a graphics card. We didn't have one before. I'm gonna choose the graphics card in just a minute here because GPU prices are still pretty high, but there's some that are a little bit more reasonable than others. Now I should also mention that this CPU being part of the Ryzen 2 series is based on Zen Plus architecture. It's a 12 nanometer process instead of 14 nanometer. There's a few other benefits to this processor as well, and it can run at a higher frequency than the last generation 1600X. Now I can't actually give you guys any performance numbers of the CPU yet because it's not launching till next week, but I can do the installation, show you physically how to put it in, and then in a follow-up video, I will show you guys some actual benchmarking numbers to show you what kind of performance you get by jumping up to this six core 12 thread processor from our four core four thread processor that's part of our APU. Now, before we move into our upgrade options, I wanted to quickly also point out that along with the Ryzen 2 processors that are launching April 19th, there's also a new lineup of motherboards. You'll find that they're 400 series motherboards. So we have X470 and B460. Uh, as, as, as compared to last generation, which was X370 and B350. Now, you're not gonna get a huge amount of extra performance or anything like that by going with the 400 series motherboards rather than the 300 series motherboards, but if you're buying a new Ryzen 2 processor right now, uh, it might be worth looking into the 400 series motherboards that are available just to see what's out there. And I am told, at least with overclocking, the higher end processors, it is a good bet to go with the 400 series motherboards, but you can get by just fine with the 300 series motherboards. The last thing to mention about the motherboards, as mentioned in the follow-up video on this original build, is that you wanna make sure that you have compatibility. Compatibility is there, but the motherboard itself might need an update depending on when it was manufactured. So let's begin by going over to the support page for our motherboard, uh, the AB350N Gaming Wi-Fi in this case from Gigabytes. And if we go down to the support area, we can find BIOS versions uh, over here. And we can actually see that since this motherboard was first manufactured back in June of 2017, they've had uh, five, six, seven, eight different BIOS updates. And the BIOS updates all do certain things, but usually it's uh, maintaining compatibility for uh, new memory modules, uh, sometimes fixing minor issues with overclocking, sometimes just uh, stability. Uh, updating the AGISA, it's the AMD uh, CPU micro microcode, and that can actually help improve performance too. So, so we wanna make sure that we have the most up-to-date version of this, and the current version is F22, which was launched on uh, March 16th, updating the AGISA. 
And actually, if I jump over to the actual system here and I pull up CPU-Z, if you're not sure uh, what version of BIOS your mother motherboard currently has, just pull up CPU-Z, go to mainboard, and you can see it right here. We're on F22B, which is a variant of the F22 that they've actually launched. Um, this might, the B might mean it's a beta BIOS. Uh, this was from February 13th. So, so I'm going to go ahead and update just to be on the safe side and make sure that we're ready for our newest processor. So I'm going to click download from America and it has downloaded and I'm going to copy that over to a USB drive. So I have my USB drive plugged in. It's just a little four gig drive. It helps if it's formatted FAT32 in my experience. But um, in here we can see a couple different files. We actually don't need those. We just need the F22 file here, the actual BIOS itself. I'm just gonna copy it over to this drive. Bada bing. And then we will restart the system. And of course it has Windows updates to do. All right, now the Windows updates have finished and it is restarting. I'm gonna tap the delete button as it is booting. You can see the quick boot menu that pops up down at the bottom and that will allow me to get into the BIOS. And the BIOS we mentioned a little bit in the second video in this series. So jump back there if you wanna know a little bit more details. But here's what I'm gonna do to prepare the BIOS for these upgrades. First thing I'm actually gonna do is go into my memory settings. If you remember before, uh, we did uh, plug in XMP settings, or you may have plugged in XMP settings. Right now you can see they're disabled, but if you have those enabled, because I'm gonna be updating the memory, go ahead and disable that. You want the memory running at the default uh, low speed, and you don't want your new memory to automatically boot up with XMP settings before you can at least go in there and set them yourselves. I'll just make sure you don't try to boot and get a boot failure or something like that and have to swap everything back in. So memory settings back to default. Uh, another thing that you can do here if you don't want to do that is just go to load optimized defaults there and that will load optimized defaults including default memory speeds. Uh, beyond that though, we want to of course update that BIOS and at least in the Gigabyte UEFI, you want to use the mouse, go down here to the bottom and over to QFlash and then here we can see update. You can also use this to back up uh, your current BIOS version if you really want to do that. Uh, it automatically chose the drive and it automatically selected that BIOS file that I downloaded, but uh, you may need to browse to find it directly. Uh, once we've chosen that, we're just going to hit enter and it verified it and then we click the button and it'll go ahead and start updating the BIOS. Again, a BIOS update is not something that you need to do all the time. It's something that you should do if you're considering a system upgrade or if you're considering, say, selling this motherboard, let's say you have an old B350 motherboard that you're trying to sell or something like that, you wanna make sure it's up to date for the new processors. So this is something that I'd recommend doing before you sell that. That way you make sure that if you sell an old B350 motherboard or X370 motherboard from last year to somebody who's gonna be updating this year with the Ryzen 2 setup, because there are gonna be people who get Ryzen 2 CPUs but still are trying to save money by using a 300 series motherboard, it'll make sure that they're able to install and get up and running and they won't be calling you back and asking you why you, they, why you sold them a motherboard that doesn't work. This will just take a minute or two and then we will re reboot. So after the BIOS update finished, we did a restart and then the Windows update finished. Um, I'm probably gonna get questions in the comment section for this video asking whether it was smart to do the BIOS update in the middle of a Windows update. I've never had an issue with that in the past, but uh, if you wanna be on the safe side, it's probably best to do all your Windows updates then do the BIOS update, one then the other, but um, it worked just fine for me in case you were wondering. So just running CPU-Z here and I can see if I go over to the motherboard, the BIOS version is updated. We're on F22 rather than F22B now with the updated date. And then also if I jump over to memory, uh, we can see that the memory speed has dropped back to the default, which is uh, 2133 or basically two times this current speed of 1066. So we're good there too. So now let's take another look at what our upgrades are actually gonna be. I already mentioned the upgraded processor, of course, that's gonna give us a lot more processing power. Um, very, very handy if you're, for example, been playing games on your system, but maybe you wanna game and stream it at the same time. The six core uh, AMD Ryzen processors have been great for that. The 1600 and 1600X, and now of course the 2600 and 2600X following up with roughly the same specs, but they're gonna run at a higher frequency, which is pretty cool. Now, because we're switching from a processor that has graphics built in to a processor that doesn't have graphics built in, we're gonna need a graphics card. Uh, but the other big thing that I would definitely upgrade or consider one, to be one of the first upgrades to this system is memory. Memory is the other thing that's really expensive right now. Prices haven't come down too much, so 
we're looking at something that's gonna hit your wallet. Right now, I have a two by four gig kit installed, so that gives eight gigs total. But this is also a mini ITX motherboard. It's very small, so there's only two slots. So for updating our memory, we're gonna actually wanna take out our two four gig sticks and replace them with two eight gig sticks to give us 16 gigabytes total and also maintains our dual channel uh, compatibility because we wanna use the same two exact sticks of memory in order to run them at the exact same speed. Now the kit I'm gonna be using today is this Trident Z RGB kit from uh, G-Skill. I'm using this because it's one of the kits that's just been universally compatible with all the Ryzen processors that I've used. It is a 3200 speed kit and two eight gig sticks makes 16 gigs total. Um, it's also got fancy RGBs on the top, so we're gonna light up the case a little bit more and make it fancier that way. But if you don't wanna spend the money on that kit because it tends to be a bit more expensive uh, than other kits that are of comparable speed but maybe not quite as blingy, you wanna go back to your motherboard's uh, support page uh, and actually go over to the support list. Now these are PDFs, so they're gonna download really quickly, but uh, we have memory support lists here. Uh, they're specifically actually saying Pinnacle Ridge support versus Raven Ridge and 7th Gen. So Pinnacle Ridge is the newest one. That's probably the list that we're gonna to wanna to download. But of course, if you're looking for compatibility with say a 2200G or a 2400G, then uh, look at this Raven Ridge list. I'm guessing they're only validating kits that they have been specifically able to test with these new Ryzen 2000 series processors. But let's take a look at what they've come up with. So this is just a big spreadsheet. Every one of these from different manufacturers is gonna look a little bit different, but basically they're separated by memory speed here. We can see the memory manufacturer. We can see the density of the DIMMs. We can see whether it's dual rank or single rank as far as where the actual memory chips are on uh, one side of the PCB or both sides of the PCB uh, from the memory. And then we can see if they've tested in one or two memory sockets and whether they've validated the XMP settings. So what I would do here is look down in the 3200 megahertz range, check that list out. Just look at the kits that are of the capacity that you're looking for, make sure that XMP has been verified. And then of course, highlight these product names, search and see if you can find them for sale in your area. It does take a little bit of hunting work to get the specific kit working with your motherboard, but that's part of the reason why I chose that team kit for this original build was because it was readily available at Newegg, works just fine with the XMP settings in this board, and this is the same case for the kit we're gonna be using right now. So we are almost ready to start upgrading. The last thing we need is that graphics card. We know our CPU, we know our memory. Graphics card is next and graphics cards are very expensive. I'm gonna be looking at desktop graphics cards just over on the Newegg website. I like choosing the Newegg radio button so I see only stuff that's being sold directly by them. And I've browsed through this a little bit, guys, and let me just tell you that the Radeon RX 500 series, like a, a, an RX 570 or 580, are very good cards. They're about $100 more than their MSRP right now. Uh, about the same goes for the GTX 1060. You can get those in the $300 to $350 range right now. Still pretty pricey when you consider that they're supposed to be $200 to $250. Uh, for my money right now, if you really have to buy a, a, a graphics card and you can't wait any longer, the GTX 1050 Ti is a solid performer, especially if you're playing at 1920 by 1080. And if I start by lowest price here, we can see that you can actually get one for $194. Now, $195 might seem like a reasonable deal for this, but bear in mind that the MSRP is $140 for this card, so you're still sp spending about $50, $55 more than MSRP. But it's a big jump up from the integrated graphics that you get uh, with the 2200G or even a 2400G, and it's sort of pushes you down the road towards getting a much higher end system. And since you have to have a graphics card to go along with the new processor, since the new processor doesn't have graphics, uh, this is kind of the most viable solution in my book for right now. All right guys, I've relocated over to my work table. I've got a Phillips head screwdriver and a rubber mat to work on. And of course, my upgrading items, the 27, sorry, 2600X. I'm gonna use the included uh, Wraith Spire Cooler that comes with the 2600X for now. I was actually going to potentially do an, an upgrading to the cooling as well today, but um, there is a 140 millimeter height limitation for coolers on this case, and the coolers I had around were a little bit too tall, so perhaps we'll follow up with that in a new video. Of course, that G-Skill Trident Z RGB memory kit I already mentioned, 3200 speed, two by eight gig, and then an MSI GeForce GTX 1050 Ti.
So just pulled all of the new parts out of the boxes and I wanted to make a quick note about the graphics card. Since we're using a 1050 Ti, there is no extra power needed on this graphics card, but that will not always be the case. And since you maybe had an extra 100 bucks to spend or something and maybe updated to a 1060, then I wanted to point this out. Many graphics cards like this Vega 56 have supplemental power required. Usually this is in the form of either a six pin or an eight pin uh, extra power plug. So you can see this one is a six and then it breaks off an extra two if it needs all eight. If you have a graphics card that requires that extra power, then you'll want to make sure to grab that extra cable, either that's affixed to your uh, power supply, if you have a power supply that has all the cables attached, or you might need to grab an extra modular cable that should have come with it like this. And then you can wrap that up and make sure that your power is plugged in. You should only be able to plug in one way. And the only other thing to note about these extra uh, eight and six pin power connectors is that try not to get them confused with the CPU supplemental power. That can be an eight pin plug, but that's two blocks of four rather than six and one. All right, so here's our trusty original builds. And uh, I was actually going to pull the motherboard out next, but what I've realized is that thanks to how this um, case is designed, I think I can actually get away without doing that. So I'm gonna remove this top piece because the top piece on this case can be re removed just in the same exact way as the side panels. That lets us get down in at the top, which is where we need to be if we're gonna be removing uh, our heat sink fan as well as the CPU. Now, if you're planning to update or upgrade your CPU cooler, then this is probably something where you'd wanna pull the motherboard out as well. You'd need to remove those four Phillips head screws to hold it down. And then you can unplug all those motherboard connectors and pretty much just leave them where they are. And that way uh, you'll be able to just kind of plug them back in. But again, since we're trying to kind of work around our existing hardware here, I am just going to remove the memory by removing those two little catches on the one side and pulling them out one at a time. That was easy enough. And then of course next is the CPU, which has its original CPU cooler on it, simply held down by four corners, four screws on the four corners. I'm gonna start by going to opposite corners and unscrewing each screw, just a couple turns, a couple rotations. Uh, again, in the similar way to mounting the CPU cooler onto the CPU originally, we just don't wanna get one corner cinched down too tight while the other corners are, are not, so we wanna loosen it in a uniform fashion around each corner. Once you've got it backed off a little bit, you can just go ahead and unscrew the rest. Now you get to experience a quirky, uh, unique trait of these AMD CPU coolers, which is that when they uh, ship you the AMD CPU cooler in the box, very handy to get this in the box, and this is a pretty solid cooler as well, it has thermal paste pre-applied, and that's what I used uh, when I first installed this. The thermal paste has a bit of a reputation for having a glue-like quality to it when you're removing the CPU or the cooler. So I got lucky there, see? I was able to kind of wiggle it and slide it a little bit off to the side. It also helps that this system was up and running uh, five or 10 minutes ago. That means that the thermal paste is gonna be a little warm. If you happen to have thermal paste that just doesn't wanna give, doesn't wanna budge, you might have a situation where you actually yank the CPU out of the socket along with the cooler when you're pulling it out. Don't worry when that happens. You should flip it over and double check your pins on the bottom. If you're pulling it straight up out of the socket, it should, it should allow it to pull it up even if that little arm is closed. But you do wanna double check here and make sure that all the pins are still straight and everything. And then of course, since you're gonna to want to probably sell this old CPU, you got this 2200G just recently for $99, right? You could probably sell it for 80 bucks still, give or take. You're gonna to wanna to do that. You're also gonna to wanna to do the same thing with your memory right now, your original two by four gig kit of memory. Throw those up on eBay or Craigslist or wherever you can safely sell them to a friend or a neighbor. Get some cash back from that original hardware and you can apply that to, towards your new upgrades. So what I'm using to clean the CPU here is a product from Arctic Clean, which is called Thermal Surface thermal material remover and surface purifier. This is actually a two-step process, uh, one fluid to remove most of the stuff and then one more to go on there and make everything pretty and clean. Absolutely not necessary to use this stuff, but I will post a link to it in the description. Um, if you guys don't have this, just go ahead and use some uh, isopropyl rubbing alcohol. I've gone ahead and cleaned off both the CPU and the CPU cooler. And again, this is just because I'm assuming you guys are gonna wanna 
uh, make the most out of your old hardware and resell it. And if I was selling an old 2200G, I would probably want to sell it along with the cooler so that anyone got it could go ahead and get set up and running and not need to worry about getting a cooler as well. Um, so there we go, nice and clean. And uh, also just want to double check those. And then of course, if you kept the original packaging for this, box it back up, throw it on Craigslist. So before I go ahead and uh, drop the 2600X in, I wanted to quickly compare the coolers. Here's the Wraith Stealth that came with the 2200G, and here is the Wraith Spire. You'll notice it is substantially taller, so you got more uh, just mass here in the aluminum hin uh, fin array around the outside. There's also a copper slug at the center, and copper is a better conductor of heat than aluminum is, so having a copper contact is very often uh, the, a thing that's done with coolers uh, if you want it to be a more effective cooler. So don't try to use your Stealth uh, with your 2600X. And uh, just wanted to also point out if you get the 2700X, the highest end actually comes with the Wraith Prism cooler, um, which is similar to this, but they say it's even better at cooling and it also has RGB LEDs. So that's something you can do. Now, thankfully, uh, with everything removed here, this is actually gonna be a really simple upgrade from this point forward. So if the gold triangle is lined up properly, it will drop right in, just, just like I just did. That's a zero insertion force socket, and I have zero insertion force themed shirts on my store. Check out the store in the link in the description. All right, uh, CPU is installed with the lever arm dropped, and now I can go ahead and take our cooler Stick that in right on top. Again, thermal paste is pre-applied here. If it wasn't, if I had no thermal material, I'd want to get some thermal paste and put a blob right dead center on that CPU. Um, but we're not doing that for right now, so I'm just going to attach this. Okay guys, file this under problems I wouldn't have if I wasn't trying to do this with the motherboard in place. There is a back plate, you guys remember, behind the AM4 socket. And that's basically falling down. It's just, it's just dropping down a little bit. So the uh, threading that I need to get this little screw into is dropping. So all I've done is taken a plastic, uh, uh, just a knife here, and I'm kind of sliding it under there just to prop it up enough, just to prop it up enough that I can get that threaded on. Um, and again, this is really just because I'm being lazy and not removing the motherboard, but if you guys are doing this exact build, then you might, be, you might need to do something like this. But improvisation, it's always fun. Memory also goes in the same way as before. Just lining up the notch and pressure straight down. And finally, we're gonna install the graphics card. So for that, uh, we got a couple expansion slots here in the back. There's a protective little plastic piece. And then beneath that, just a couple more Phillips head screws that are holding on our two PCI Express expansion slot covers. We do need to remove both of these. And then from here, we'll just take our graphics card in. Uh, PCI Express slot is along the bottom, and that of course lines up with the PCI Express slot on the motherboard. It's one notch on one end of it, so pretty tough to get this in backwards or anything. Uh, we do need to push some of our cables to the side here from where we routed them when the original build was, was done. Uh, there is a little notch here along the bottom of the graphics card which is just kind of there incidentally, but I find it's a convenient place to route through cables like the HD audio cable we have right here. And once it's slotted into the motherboard, we can secure it on top with those two screws. Moved back over here to the desk where I have monitors and stuff. I have plugged the system back in, but it's not powered back on yet. I do want to point out that the video outs on the motherboard, which were pre previously usable with our 2200G, now are no longer usable because there is no graphics, no iGPU that's part of our new 2600X CPU. Our 2200G and our memory, we are setting aside for selling to apply towards the cost of the system. I'm gonna flip the power switch in the back on the power supply, and then I'm gonna hit the power button, and the system spins up, and that's always a good thing. We have initial power. Uh, so we did boot up, but it actually booted all the way into Windows, which is good. Uh, that means things are working. New graphics device. So it did reset to default resolution of, uh, 
1280 by 720 is the best we can do right now. We are gonna need to install a driver for our new graphics card, so we would get that from NVIDIA. You can download the latest one. I'm not gonna go through that, but I do wanna double check that everything else is running at the right speed. So you're probably pretty familiar with the BIOS by now, but I've done the same thing to get into it that I did before by tapping the delete button as the system was booting up. It's letting me know that it's done an automatic BIOS reset. So we did that kind of preemptively um, beforehand, but um, oftentimes the BIOS will do that when it recognizes new hardware. But here we can go in and for instance, over on the right, we can see our CPU running at 3.6 gigahertz. Uh, and then if we go up here to motherboard intelligent stuff, I always forget how, how Gigabyte labels things. But here we can get back into the same stuff that we got back into before, such as uh, what the CPU is running at, advanced CPU core settings. You know what would be nice if Gigabyte did it would, is just tell us right from the get-go what's installed. So even though, even though I'm not being told directly what CPU is installed, that's just part of Gigabyte's choice for their UI here, I can at least go to my advanced memory settings and uh, I'm just going to switch to profile one for XMP mode so that I'll get my memory running at its rated speed of 3200 megahertz. Uh, that's pretty much all I'm gonna do here. Um, as, as mentioned, everything else is probably gonna be within the operating system. So let's save and exit. And the last thing I'm gonna do, hopefully, is run CPU-Z, the updated version of CPU-Z so it actually recognizes my processor. We got the Ryzen 5 2600X right there, properly listed TDP. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the speeds right now because I'm not supposed to show you guys that yet, but we can also see over here with our updated BIOS, uh, everything's recognized properly, and we can even look at our memory and see that the memory speed has taken. We're at about 1600 megahertz, which equals 32 megahertz, 3200 megahertz double data rate, and that means we're good to go. The installed updated software is pretty much ready. The final thing, of course, would be to download and install that NVIDIA driver for the graphics card, and then we could get back to gaming, or maybe try setting up like OBS or XSplit to do gaming and streaming at the same time. There's so many things you can do now that this system has gone from being a pretty entry-level quad-core with integrated graphics to a six-core, 12-thread CPU, a discrete graphics card with a pretty decent amount of horsepower, and overall a much more powerful system with 16 gigs of system memory. All right, guys, that is all for this video. The upgrade of the originally $500 build, now it's more of like a $750 or $800 build. I actually have not added up all of the cost of the parts in here because, uh, you know, you sold some parts, you bought some new parts, it's hard to keep track of. But I will get a list of all the parts in here and I'll put it down in the video's description. There's also some other helpful links to uh, my original how to build video, as well as my first five things to do with a new PC build video, which if you have not gotten a new PC set up before, should be very helpful with getting Windows 10 installed, driver updates, and all that good stuff. But guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Hit the thumbs up button on your way out if it helped you out at all, and share it with your friends if you know anyone who's interested in building a gaming PC anytime soon. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.